Tonight on 2020, how did this beautiful setting turn into the camping trip from hell? This investigator is on the case. No accident. She definitely died at someone's hands. The daughter, who never came back from a weekend outing, high atop a cliff. Hey, so Mrs. Smith, I don't think this was an accident. Her three friends who were there. What was she doing? What was she thinking? You know, I don't know. Pleading the fifth in a civil case. Why would they want to kill their friend? But there's a second mystery. We got you two present. The grown son with everything to live for caught in a bad romance. <laughs> An apparent suicide. He didn't do this. I know he didn't do it. The girlfriend who was with him. What does she know? I believe she was aiming for the heart. The police aren't pointing any fingers. But this pit bull of a private eye tells their grieving mothers that nothing is what it seems. Rage. This girl had rage. Now we're taking you inside her all new investigation into both cases. But to come up here and spend the night? This is kind of crazy. Tonight, what will win out? A police investigation or a mother's intuition? I believe she is a cold blooded killer. There's no way it's going to end well. Good evening. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. Her private investigation firm is called Without Warning. And that is exactly how it was. A complete shock, no warning, when Sheila Wysocki first learned about the murder of a college friend years ago. She helped break the cold case when the police couldn't. Well, now she's still in business, and two other families are hoping that she can do the same for them. They're trapped in that same shock of finding out their grown children have died suddenly without warning but with a lot of unanswered questions. So join us tonight for the twists and turns you're about to witness yourself. Weigh in on Facebook and Twitter. Here's Deborah Roberts. She's a suburban mom making time for target practice. But don't be fooled. 54-year-old Sheila Wasaki is also a hired gun, a secret weapon for desperate families who feel the system has failed them. Your typical stay-at-home mom before she helped crack the case of her best friend's murder. Sheila has made headlines as a soccer mom who doubles as a no-nonsense private eye. Her office is her car. She's always on the go, now working overtime for two devastated moms whose young adult children died under strange circumstances. Now they're pressing wrongful death lawsuits against the people they hold responsible. You look unassuming. Nobody would look at you necessarily and guess P.I. No. But yet you get in there and you start digging. I dig. I think I owe that to the family. Whoa. Recently, her job brought her here. <laughs> Not the typical place for a middle-aged woman. It's a sun and alcohol soaked celebration called Wake Fest. <laughs> kind of like Cancun with catfish. Each summer, small town Smithville, Tennessee is overrun with partiers. There to cheer on wakeboarders, but mostly to float, flirt, and booze it up on Center Hill Lake. Bathing suits, bikinis, I mean, you can't go wrong. July 2015. <laughs> Lauren Agee joins the fun with her longtime childhood friend, Hannah Palmer. Here they are road tripping from their hometown outside Nashville. Lauren posting, can't wait for Wake Fest this weekend. And Lauren's not just joining the party, she's the life of the party. Spirited, silly, and striking. An avid dancer, she's even performed in music videos. With devoted mom Sherry, her biggest fan. We were inseparable. You called her a mini me? Mm-hmm. And she called you Mama Bear? Mama Bear. Let me hear that boy. Let me, let me hear that boy. Let me. In her second year at a local college, she's studying criminal science. She wanted to solve mysteries. Kind of ironic because you're trying to solve the mystery of what happened to her. Exactly. What happened to Lauren begins that weekend at Wakefest. Friday, she and Hannah slip right into party mode, all smiles on the lake. With them, Hannah's boyfriend, Aaron Lilly, and his friend, Chris Stout, whom Lawrence just met. Both men clearly adrenaline junkies based on their social media accounts. On land, on the water, in the sky. At night, they're at the only bar in town at the marina, 
That's Lauren waving at the camera. Saturday evening, off-duty cop and Wakefest security officer Chris Yarchuk bumps into Lauren at the bar. What'd you make of her? She was energetic, lively. He sees her leave around 2 a.m. after a night of drinking, finding her way in the dark with Hannah, Chris, and Aaron. So they left. They left. The four of them walked down the dock. That was the last, that was last time them. I saw them, yeah. They're heading to their camping spot, an outcropping across from the marina, down the lake from the houseboats that make up Wakefest. There's a 35-foot drop to the lake on one side, a breath-catching 90-foot drop on the other. Hannah and boyfriend Aaron will crash in a tent. Lauren and Chris will bunk together in a hammock on the edge of the cliff. Incredible that anyone would sleep so dangerously close to a precipice. Samantha Arnold, friends with Lauren and Hannah, was on that cliff with the group the night before Lauren's death and says it was scary but thrilling too. Oh, I was scared. So scared. It was just very steep and I'm climbing and I'm climbing and then I'm going higher and I'm like, my legs are slipping, kind of like the rocks are taking me. I think these kids enjoy the danger of it all and they're all outdoorsy kind of guys and adventurous. Chris and Aaron would later tell police the Wakefest weekend was going well. All camped out, everything was awesome. Uh, you know, we all drank, had a good old time. Uh, eventually, we ended up making our way all back to the campsite. The only way to get to the site is by boat, which can be eerie at night. These are the voices of Lauren and her friends captured on a video she took. We are in a canoe. Oh, it's a cliff on both sides. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. We're going into a death trap. Death trap. Tragically, an apt description. The next afternoon, Sunday, locals Lynn Blair and his son Dylan are fishing in the lake. It's around 4 o'clock, and they're coasting toward a cove near the cliff. So you were going right through this little area right through here? Yes. I looked over and saw something in the water. I went ahead and stopped, and we was fixing to drop the anchor. What did you think you were seeing? Well, I didn't know. It, kept, it bothered me. Something bright floating in the water. Hot pink shorts. Then the stunning realization. It's a body. She's lying face down. It was terrifying. And what, what's going through your mind? We knew it was a, a young lady. I'm thinking, she has a mom and a daddy. All those people's lives are going to be different from now on. Somebody's life is about to be ruined. Absolutely. That awful moment about to happen for Lauren's mom, Sherry, and her husband, Michael, who get a visit from police. He says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your daughter didn't make it. Oh, my gosh. I said to him, where are the people that she was with? They are being questioned by police. These are recordings taken that week of Hannah, Chris, and Aaron. We need to know every step that happened. No, everybody's pretty drunk. Chris tells police Lauren had been talking about leaving the campsite to go see someone. He says when they went to sleep, she was in the hammock with him. But when they woke up, Lauren was gone. I woke up and I woke him up and I said, where's Lauren? And he said, she got up a while ago. He was like, but I don't, I mean, I didn't feel her or anything. And I said, okay, have you seen her since? And he said, no. And I asked how long, he said he wasn't sure. Hannah saying she was worried, especially since Lauren's flip-flops, purse, and cell phone are still at the campsite. She didn't have her shoes. She didn't have her keys, wallet, phone. And she like would not leave without that stuff, you know? Yeah. Did any of these kids call somebody when they thought she was missing? No. They went to Wakefest, they even though their friend is missing. Right. So now you're beginning to smell something funny. Right. I honestly wasn't really worried about it because I didn't think anything had happened. I didn't think anything would happen. We were like, well, maybe somebody came and got her. And uh, then we went down to the boat dock and we waited and waited and waited. And it almost seems like I'm a suspect right now, you know, but I know you guys are just doing your job. New Tonight family and friends want to know how a 21-year-old Hendersonville woman died in Center Hill Lake. She camped this weekend on the edge of a cliff. Her body found Sunday in the water below. As for the official investigation, the early read is that Lauren, whose blood alcohol level is more than twice the legal limit, accidentally slipped and fell. The DeKalb County Sheriff says her death does not appear to be foul play. The autopsy results could take a few weeks. Not so fast. Sherry gets a phone call from a concerned officer that will put Mama Bear on the hunt. Hey, so Mrs. Smith, I don't think this was an accident. And the claws really come out when she sees this Instagram posted by Lauren's hammock mate, Chris Stout, 
the day after her daughter died. Wakefest 2015 went pretty good this year. Met some new friends that made it awesome. In the photo, Hannah and Aaron smiling on a boat. But worse, Sherry says that edited post originally said, Best weekend ever. He wrote best weekend ever. And you're going to put on your Instagram best weekend ever? We were appalled. Appalled and now driven to get Sheila Wysocki on the case. Sheila is a pit bull disguised as a soccer mom. She has no fear. And that soccer mom has other balls in play, including a strikingly similar case for another mom who also suspects foul play in the death of her son. So suicide is not crossing your mind at all? Never crossed my mind. Never. It's not a suicide. It is, in my opinion, a homicide. Homicide. Absolutely. Stay with us. continues. Oh, and my trench coat. Private eye Sheila Wasaki is living out of a suitcase, splitting time between Lauren Agee's mom, Sherry Smith, in Tennessee, and another family 700 miles away in Coppell, Texas. Pam and John Cruz have hired the dogged detective to unpack the mystery surrounding the sudden death of their son, Jonathan. There's no way to make sense of something like this. It's just unthinkable. It should have never happened. So this is Jonathan's room. Still in shock, Pam has kept her son's old bedroom intact. Is it hard to come in here now? It gives me peace. Still has a little of his smell. I know exactly what he smelled like, so I can smell him. Very special. Life as she knew it came crashing down when this 911 call came in. It's Jonathan's distraught girlfriend on the phone saying he shot himself, a notion Jonathan's family finds incomprehensible. And I said he did not do this. First of all, he would not have ever shot himself. So suicide is not crossing your mind at all? Never crossed my mind. Never. He had a good job. He had plans for the future. He had a brand new car, the apartment. He was going to go furniture shopping. Well, if you're going to kill yourself, you really don't need that furniture. He was just exuberant all the time. He, was, he woke up in the morning with that, like, what are we going to do today attitude every day. Oh, actually, Danny, no, no, open this one first. He delighted in showering his younger sister, Danny, with presents. He was just a giant teddy bear, you know? Anything he could do to make somebody happy, he would do. That includes his new girlfriend, 26-year-old Brenda Lazaro. Athletic, shy, and pretty. She's a kung fu instructor. Pick him in the head, He, a black belt in taekwondo. They bond over martial arts. She's also best friends with his sister, Danny. She and I were, were paired to choreograph a fight scene together. That's how we became friends. Here's video of the two on the Kung Fu demo team. How did you feel about Brenda? I liked her. Very reserved. She doesn't say much at all. Was he falling for her? Was she falling for him? It seemed like they were very into each other. He was a very touchy-feely, affectionate person. He always like had a hand on her shoulder. The romance moves quickly. After three months together, Jonathan and Brenda are already talking marriage, even children, taking happy selfies together. Then everything changes on Super Bowl Sunday, 2014. The Seahawks are world champs. At 11.30 p.m. and that 911 call. Did he use a gun or what happened? Yes, he used a gun. Did he mean to do it? Did he do it on purpose? No. Yeah, he did on purpose. That's Brenda on the line saying her boyfriend just shot himself in bed. Hold on, listen to me. Listen to me. Oh, we got to be able to find you, so I need you to find some way to tell me what the address is. Frantic, it takes her minutes to finally give the exact location of Jonathan's new apartment. Strange, since she helped pick it out. And she kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, no, 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 no. All these hesitant, stalling tactics. It was like pulling teeth to get her to say anything. We're just uh, having a discussion, and we're just talking, and then I just, he just said he loved me, and I didn't believe him. Maybe he said he said he was going to prove that he was. Okay. Out of the blue, a gunshot. I didn't know that he had a gun. That 911 call strikes Sheila as odd. 
generally you would think she would be wanting to help him, talking about his needs, and she's talking about loving her. She's kind of explaining things a little too early. Her boyfriend had apparently ended his life with a single shot to the chest. It was just unreal. And I remember there's a picture of him sitting there in this little Boy Scout uniform, just holding it like so big, if I could hug it. Did you ever know that you're my hero? I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to say that that guy right there is my brother. Days later, the short but full life of 27-year-old Jonathan Cruz. He knew that he was kind, he was loving, he was big and bold is celebrated by his heartbroken family. He touched lives in ways that we had no idea. In a series of photographs, the ball boy, the boy scout, the boyfriend. But missing from his funeral, his girlfriend, the last person to see him alive. His girlfriend didn't show up at the funeral? No. Or the viewing. Or the viewing. She told me that she couldn't do it. She couldn't. She was too upset. Hours after the funeral, Jonathan's sister Danny says she gets her first indication something's off with Brenda. She went crazy on me. She was complaining that she wasn't involved enough. None of you thought for a second to acknowledge our love during his funeral. I was just mad. Like, how dare you say these crazy things? How dare you make demands? When we come back, Sheila takes us to Jonathan's apartment. What can we learn from a dummy? His left hand had zero gunpowder. And how she believes he died. I believe that's exactly where she was aiming. Next. Pam Cruz wants justice for her son, Jonathan. Police have made no arrests. They haven't closed the case, but it's inactive. Sheila Wasaki is anything but. She's been investigating for 18 months, gathering evidence for a wrongful death suit, challenging the autopsy report, which declares Jonathan's manner of death undetermined. So this is Jonathan's exact apartment. Sheila takes me back to Jonathan's apartment. And the bedroom is back here. To point out what she says are red flags in the case. So this is where he was found. This is where Jonathan was found. And he was positioned at the edge of the bed. In the bed, we place a dummy and prop gun so she can demonstrate her theory. He was right-handed. Um, there was gunpowder gun on the top of his hand, so there was none on his palm. His left hand had zero gunpowder. What initially concerned you about this? Because when you think about it, a guy who knows guns well right. is lying in bed and he shoots himself in the torso? But notice what you just did. You did the easiest hand to shoot in the torso. The left hand? No gunpowder residue. So, so he would have I, had to go around. And he couldn't. Gunshot residue can't always point to the shooter, but Sheila points to something else. If you're gonna kill yourself, generally you shoot um, in the mouth. You shoot upward. Um, you don't lay down getting ready for bed and shoot yourself. But if Jonathan didn't shoot himself, then who did? Sheila says critical information came from this couple, Emily and Jacob Ramsey, Jonathan's dearest friends. They'd gone out to dinner with Jonathan and Brenda. I walked in, gave him a big hug. Jacob gave him a hug, and then we sat down at the table and just proceeded to try and get to know Brenda at that time. What did you think, Jacob, when you met her? Most of the girlfriends he's had in the past were very vivacious, very alive. Brenda was completely opposite she was just kind of shut off the double date is a dud brenda making a dismal impression and apparently becoming jealous of the hello hug between jonathan and emily he hugged emily which put brenda over the edge she wanted to isolate jonathan she later ups the ante with her new love forcing him to unfriend women from his facebook page were you worried about him and brenda in my head i just saw here's another crazy girl that he's dating but it seems that after two months, Brenda's still fuming over that platonic hug. Jonathan's concerned he must now choose between Emily and Brenda. You know, the things that she was trying to make him do, and they were deal breakers for him. Texting his sister. Choices are A, fight it and try to make it better. B, choose Brenda. C, refuse to give up either and see if Brenda ends it. D, 
End it with Brenda now. Later that same day, he told me D was his final choice. So there was no doubt in your mind that he aimed to break up with Brenda. Mm -hmm. Jonathan knew the relationship with Brenda was becoming toxic, and he needed to get out. Hey, good morning on this Super Bowl Sunday. America's the next day, that day. fateful Super Bowl Sunday, he meets up with Emily and Jacob at this Mexican restaurant, telling them that Brenda's threatened by his friendship with Emily. When unexpectedly, the martial arts master makes a menacing phone call. She just started yelling at me and telling me that I was a disrespectful little girl. So she's verbally attacking you. You hug my man, that's so rude, you stay off my man. And I said, well, he's my really good friend and we've never dated each other, we've never kissed, it's never been anything like that. Rage, this girl had rage. Irrational, unstable rage. During their goodbyes, Jonathan tells his friends he's breaking up with Brenda that night. Later, after the Super Bowl's ended, Emily gets a peculiar text from Jonathan's number. I want to die. Period. Had you ever gotten anything like that from oh, him before? No. I was just kind of like, what is going on? Like, that's so weird. Despite her multiple phone calls, radio silence from Jonathan. Until the next morning. My phone rang, and it was Jonathan's brother. He just said it like John's dead. I just kind of, I immediately broke down. You know, it was something that I'd never um, experienced before. 11.37, Jacob called me hysterical. Just, I mean, just sobbing, saying he's dead. Like he was shot, he's dead. She then remembers that weird text message. It was all coming in, like, something is wrong. She texted me. That was not him. He would have never texted me that. You're thinking Brenda texted you? Yes. Her. Later, Emily calls police and also tells Jonathan's mom, Pam, of her suspicions of Brenda. My mother's heart was like, okay, I, I, this makes sense now. I knew right then. I knew. And What did you know? That she had done it. Why would she do it? What well, sounds like pathological jealousy problem going on. That's a story you hear every day. You know, people kill for that reason all the time. Pam's convinced that her son didn't commit suicide, that he was killed. So how do you think it might have happened? I believe she walked up and shot him, and then he rolled over. Jonathan was shot on the left side of the chest. The bullet passed through his body and lodged into the mattress. For Sheila, that bullet trajectory is key. For him to have done it himself, he would have had to shoot himself downward? Yes. But if, as Sheila believes, Brenda fired the gun standing over him... It's an exact shot. And the, what's interesting is in the 911 call, Brenda says he was shot in the heart. I believe that's exactly where she was aiming. He broke her heart that night by breaking up with her. And then she shoots him possibly shoots in the heart, you think? Right. She was a I believe she was aiming for the heart. And speaking of that 911 call, Sheila says there's a lot of information to be gleaned from it. Take a second listen. Did he, he do it? it? Did he do it on purpose? No. Yeah, he did on purpose. <laughs> I think she answered it honestly, saying, no, he didn't do it on purpose, and then caught herself. A Freudian slip. It's definitely something to stop and, and think about in an investigation. How frustrating was it for you that police just didn't seem to turn anything up? There have been other police officers who have looked at this and, and are scratching their heads as to why there has not been an arrest. And so we scratch our heads right along with them. Next, the mommy P.I. makes waves in the Lauren A.G. case, reeling in Lauren's Wakefest companion. You, you understand that we're recording. Plus an intriguing test. Watch what happens next. Twenty twenty continues. Sheila Wasaki's been working the Lauren Agee case on land and lake. 
back in Smithville, Tennessee, where Lauren's body was discovered after camping on a cliff with her friend Hannah Palmer, Hannah's boyfriend Aaron Lilly, and his friend Chris Stout. To Sherry Smith's dismay, DeKalb County Police have closed the case on her daughter, finding no evidence of foul play. The medical examiner calling Lauren's death an accident, determining she fell from a cliff, landed on rocks, and rolled into the lake. Sheila has her own opinions and begins locating witnesses and assembling evidence filed later in Sherry's wrongful death lawsuit. When you start looking at the autopsy and the crime scene photos and you look at her injuries, they weren't adding up. Sheila points out hemorrhaging in Lauren's neck and sees a possible sign of strangulation. Somebody either held her down or choked her. And she's following a lead, this police officer who called Sherry Smith. I basically just wanted her to know that I strongly felt that it was not an accident. Ryan Mellison was working for a neighboring police department on the day Lauren's body was found and spent time with Chris and Aaron at the scene. They were uh, extremely nervous. In a rare step, Mellinson questions the findings of his brothers in blue, saying Aaron and Chris expressed no sympathy or concern for Lauren. Just their body language and demeanor toward the incident told me that there was something wrong with the picture. People don't act like that unless they know something or they have something to hide. Could he be right? Sheila tracks down another skeptical police officer from outside DeKalb County. Remember Chris Yarchuk? He worked security at Wakefest and met Lauren the night before she died. He too suspects something's off. Your radar kind of was yeah, raised right away. Absolutely. He leads us up to the campsite, a snake infested rocky outpost. We take the same route as Lauren and her friends with the steep incline and the unstable footing. Even with a rope, it's no small task. It's not easy getting up here. Okay. okay. So this is the spot. Wow. That's quite a trek. Great view, though. Uh, the terrain, treacherous, even in daylight. It's hard to believe that they came up here in the middle of the night, and they're intoxicated, too. This area here is where Lauren and the others set up their campsite. Do you believe she slipped down this hill and fell to her death? I do not. Yarchik's main question, how did Lauren's body end up in a cove, hundreds of feet away from the cliff? If she fell off the steep side, her body would have had to travel around a large bend. And if she fell off the other side with the more gradual incline, he wonders, would she have ended up in the water? If she slipped and fell down here, mm -hmm. could she have made it into the water? There's too many trees here, there's too many rocks. There's just no way. I mean, you could maybe make it to halfway down where it flattens out. In an unscientific demonstration, he shows us his theory with a mannequin. Similar size and weight, um, 105 pound dummy. And I'll just drop it going forward. It was caught in the branches, didn't even make it down to the bottom. Correct, it's not even halfway down. Yorchik alleges police skipped fundamental steps in their investigation, including properly securing the scene and collecting a rape kit. At the lake, Sheila tests the water currents. It's not moving. If she had fallen here, maybe she might have made it to this cove? I don't think so. I think she'd stay here based on the currents. And interviews those boaters who found Lauren's body. And her legs and arms were pointed down. Yes. But she really wants to talk to Hannah, Chris, and Aaron. Sheila takes a trip from Smithville to the Sunshine State. I flew to Florida to talk to Hannah. To talk to Hannah. Hannah and Aaron moved to South Florida soon after Lauren's death. Here they are on social media enjoying the sun and surf. When Sheila arrives for a chat, Hannah is willing. You, you understand that we're recording yes. and you're okay, okay with that? Yes, that's okay. Fine. All right. She repeats her story that Lauren was simply yeah, missing when she woke right. up. From the time I went to sleep to the time I went awake, there's nothing. It's just a void of what, what was she doing? What was she thinking? Was she peeing? Was she with somebody else? Were, you know, I don't know. As for Chris, who Hannah and Lauren met that weekend. He was asleep. I didn't know him well, but people ask me, do you think he could have done it? No. 
I don't think he would have been physically capable without me hearing. Mm -hmm. Hannah explains why she didn't call Lauren's parents and authorities that morning when Lauren was gone. Everybody's like, you know, don't worry, you know, Lauren's the kind that's make friends with anyone. And, right. Okay, I try to keep calm. I searched as much as I could without having to go to every single boat. I figured she would find us. Mid-conversation, Sheila says there's a telling moment, and she's immediately suspicious. Hannah's phone starts ringing. It's Aaron on the phone. What we were able to hear was stick to the story. Aaron said stick to the story. Yep. Next, is that the clue she needs in the Lauren Agee case? And a crucial find in the Jonathan Cruz case. The mommy PI tracks down Brenda's ex and he's ready to kiss and tell. She almost ruined my life. Don't go away. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Two moms, and until this very moment, two strangers. This was actually her audition picture. Sherry Smith and Pam Cruz, members of a sad sorority. You're both a part of this horrible club that nobody it's wants a, to be a part of. A sisterhood that we didn't choose to be part of, mm -hmm. but we are. Both fueled by gut instinct and united by understanding. Why are they not here with us anymore? I know. Yeah, it's just so unfair. You don't know. You don't know that this is what I'm going to have left. And both believing the authorities have dropped the ball. The police won't listen to anything I have to say. On this day, a third mom, that pit bull private eye, joins them to discuss their cases. We're going to work on on Thursday. Okay. And your 911 call. Armed with information, the moms are taking justice into their own hands, filing wrongful death lawsuits against the friends who were among the last to see their beloved children alive. What do you hope to accomplish with a civil lawsuit? Finding the truth. That all the lies will be uncovered, all the truth will be uncovered. Uncovered, they say, because in a civil suit, defendants are required to testify under oath, meaning that perhaps for the first time, Brenda Lazaro may be directly asked the question, did you shoot your boyfriend, Jonathan Cruz? During her deposition, we asked that question, did you shoot Jonathan Cruz? And she took the Fifth Amendment. Pleading the Fifth, the right not to answer because she may incriminate herself. If you have nothing to hide, why not just tell what happened? Just tell. Brenda won't talk, but in their deposition, some of the people closest to her do. Friends, family members, kung fu teammates. Some saying they don't think Brenda would kill. She's too sweet. I don't think she's capable of murder. She's a very bright and bubbly person. Others recounting conflicting stories of what Brenda told them. He put a gun to his heart. Well, she said he shot himself in the head. They were not even having an argument. She went to the bathroom, and when she came out, he was already shot. Who among those depositions stood out for you? What made me think we had a case was Matthew Kirk. Matthew Reza Kirk. He gave us a good profile of what Brenda was like to date. Matthew Kirk, Brenda's ex-boyfriend. She almost ruined my life. They met in college and were together for five years. She was jealous of any woman I talked to. She'd always say things such as, you like her? She just got crazy whenever I went around any girl. How, how did she go crazy? <sighs> she cut herself. He says Brenda harmed herself regularly, more than a hundred times. His talking about her history and how she isolated him. She did similar things with Jonathan, even though, remember, they only dated a few months. Matthew says Brenda was possessive, yet never violent. Well, except for maybe once. She threatened to kill my mom one time. Would she, would she Well, say? no, she just held some scissors in her hand, saying, I'm going to go see your mom. That was one time. Okay. And that's the time that I called the police on her. Brenda is jealous, creates drama, plays the victim. I believe she is a cold-blooded killer. Brenda Lazaro has denied all the allegations against her. If this is so clear to you, why isn't Brenda Lazaro under arrest? A great question for the Coppell Police Department. I do not understand it. In a statement, the Coppell Police Department says it does not have enough evidence to present to a grand jury. We tracked down Brenda Lazaro, still working at that kung fu school just minutes away from the crew's home. 
She's now married with a baby. Both Brenda and her attorneys declined to comment on the lawsuit. You've lost your brother, and she is living her life. I think it's hideous. What do you want her to know? I want her to know that she is not fooling everyone, that there are people out there who know exactly who she is. As for Lauren Agee, her cliffside friends are also moving on, for better or worse. According to Facebook, Hannah and Aaron are now engaged, while Chris Stout is currently in jail for an unrelated DUI charge. And like Brenda, all pleaded the fifth in the wrongful death lawsuit filed against them. Hannah, Chris, and Aaron deny they had anything to do with Lauren's death. Hannah Palmer declined to speak with us, but her friend Samantha Arnold did. Hannah and Lauren, and knowing um, the connection that they had with each other, um, that Hannah couldn't do, possibly do anything like that to her. The entire lawsuit is, if I have to say it, bogus. To a lot of people, you look like heartbroken parents who want to blame kids for the death of your daughter. So be it. Yes, we are grieving parents. We're grieving every day. But we just want the truth. Next, Sherry Smith finally gets her day in court. I have hope, and let's see how this goes. A judge's ruling. Out of Lauren Taylor, AG deceased versus. Stay with us. While Brenda Lazaro, Jonathan Cruz's ex-girlfriend, continues honing her martial arts skills, Pam Cruz awaits a day in court against her. And Sherry Smith finally gets her day of reckoning, nearly two years after losing her daughter. A judge is about to decide if her wrongful death lawsuit against Hannah Palmer can proceed. I'm not nervous. I'm just, uh, you know, yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> First, a blow to Sherry's hopes. The judge dismisses nearly all the observations of witnesses like police officers Chris Yarchuk and Ryan Melanson and the conclusions of private investigator Sheila Wasaki. Their opinions were not based on any relevant scientific methods, processes, and data and seemed to be just pulled out of the thin air. In fact, we spoke with Dr. Jonathan Arden, a forensic pathologist. To me, the evidence is highly consistent with a fall off a cliff. As for the police investigation, the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department defends its detective work, saying there's simply no evidence in this tragic case that will support Lauren's death being considered homicide or foul play. And the judge agrees, ruling there will be no trial against Hannah Palmer. The court finds that the plaintiff has not produced any shred of evidence that anyone intentionally harmed Miss Ag. It's a disappointing setback for Sherry. Her lawyer, Alex Little, says they will appeal. But it's just another day in court, and we'll proceed on, and um, we expect to prevail in the end. Sheila says this about the judge's findings. Was I offended by what the judge said? No, because I deal with it every day, and I'm prepared for it. And I love that people underestimate me. Keep it coming. Sherry's lawsuit against Aaron Lilly and Chris Stout is still pending. They have not responded to request for comment. I am going to go and get a large glass of wine. No matter what happens, this grieving mom says nothing will lessen the pain of losing Lauren, an agony she doesn't need to explain to Pam Cruz. To stay close to Jonathan, she wears a special necklace. This necklace I'm wearing, the little heart, has a little bit of Jonathan's ashes inside. Get to carry a little bit of them every day. You're such a good boy. After meeting, the two moms vow to stay in touch. I feel like I've known you for so long. I know, I feel before. like I've known you too. United in their love for their children, their loss, and the woman in whom they placed so much faith. You get emotional with some of these cases, don't you? With all of them. Pam wants to be heard. She wants Jonathan to be heard. Same with Lauren and Sherry. And I hear them. And Sherry hopes Lauren can hear what's in her heart. So we are sending these to heaven, guys. All right, on the count of three. One, two. two. Three. Love you. In a statement to 2020, Hannah Palmer wrote in part, the court's decision allows me once again to look to my future. 
I would like to express my deepest sympathies to Lauren's family and hope that they ultimately find the peace and closure they deserve. The Cruz family civil case against Brenda Lazaro in the death of their son Jonathan is now 